Hello world, welcome back. Today's episode is on integrated care. Um, on the screen with me is Dr. Sumat Manker. He is a doctor at Camel Health System. He finished his residency at Loma Linda University in both uh, family medicine and preventative uh, medicine. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. So I think it's safe to say that everybody agrees on uh, advancing the integration of mental health care in all branches of medicine is the right thing to do. And on a personal level, it is also my mission. However, I think many organizations still see this concept as a um, not so easy concept to to embrace and to incorporate, and which I, I, I can understand that because integrated care is not just providing mental health services and uh, substance abuse services. We're talking about having behavioral health consultation and treatment be incorporated in all clinical pathways uh, for treating chronic medical uh, conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, and um, uh, chronic pain. So really to truly achieve this, it takes a lot of leadership engagement, right? To build uh, an infrastructure uh, to allow this uh, such practice and the bottom line is the cost as well. You know, you have to map out the cost for sustainability. So what is your take on this? What do you think of integrated care? Uh, is this concept something that we really should push through uh, or is it just a fancy concept? Uh, that's a fantastic question. I think uh, with respect to integrated care, and I think what you're what you're re referring to is integrating mental health with primary care. And I think um, in, in my residency, we uh, that I did at Loma Linda, that was definitely a big focus of our of our training was how do we, how can we identify uh, the mental health barriers to health? Um, somebody who has chronic disease, you know, there there are two. Two types of things, right? So one is acute disease. You you broke your leg. You you have a fracture. Um, you put a cast on it. You pin it. Whatever it is, you heal from it. You do some physical therapy. You get better, and you go back to your prior level of baseline uh, uh, level of function. On the other end, you have chronic diseases such as diabetes. Um, diabetes is not just something that you can take a pill and it all of a sudden you get better. You live with it until. Uh, until you either can either reverse it or you either able to control it or you have the poor consequences of it. So when you are diagnosed with uh, a chronic condition, uh, people have to change. They don't only have to change um, taking the medications, but it's also having to change the lifestyles, having to prick themselves three times a day to see what their glucose level is and then adjusting insulin. That's another prick. So you're, you're, you're having a lot of changes to your routine that um and i think that brings about resistance from people that brings about challenges to people that they've been, that they never faced and people sometimes become um not adherent as we call it but there are barriers that are brought up so identifying what those barriers are are really important and being able to work through them um is also quite important so where the mental health piece comes in is to be able to identify help us as primary care physicians identify where these barriers are and how to how we can help the patient move past these barriers um, in our training we would we had um mental health as a core component uh, of, of our uh, rounds and presentations. Every time I saw a patient in clinic, I would chief or tell the story of the patient not only to my attending but also to the behavioral health who was listening on the side and who was always trying to figure out and help me learn better what kinds of mental health uh, issues that might exist that I can positively impact for the patient. So, so to drive this, to take somebody from a disease state saying they only have or, or, or labeling them with one kind of a chronic disease or another, but um, but we need to, to take that further, take it further into the aspect of understanding some of the socioeconomic consequences or kind of what's happening with them, what kind of mental health issues they have to be able to help them break, break some of these barriers. So I don't think this is just a fancy new term. I think it's a important important um, uh, core principle that, that needs to be integrated with, with primary care better, better than it, it currently is. You have a very unique role. You can practice in primary care and, and also you see patients at um, the hospital as well. What kind of challenges do you face? Great. 
Um, one of the things uh, we need to look at when we talk about challenges. So, so you're right. As an extensivist, or the role that I that I have with the Caramel Health Health System, I have a unique role to be able to be in the outpatient setting where I see patients um, for various different reasons and be a part of a robust outpatient clinical team. But then also when our members or our, our patients get sick, I also see them in the inpatient side of things. Um, and what you deal with here, there is there is a divide between the outpatient world and outpatient setting and the inpatient setting um, when, you, when it comes to clinical care and, and what kinds of things can you really take care of in these settings. When it comes to mental health, um, oftentimes in the acute or inpatient setting, we see a lot of delirium, acute delirium. Remember, care more health systems, for most part, our patients are geriatric and, and the elderly, uh, elderly folks. And so that's what we see a lot of in the in, in the inpatient side um, there are definitely patients who suffer uh, and struggle with schizophrenia with bipolar disorder with depression um, and things like that but a lot of times um, what at least what my experience has been is that that's not the reason why they're in the acute setting they're in the acute setting because of a chf exacerbation or something else related to their um, other physical health um, so a lot of times what happens is we shift saying okay fine you have this or you know i notice that you're depressed or you're sad or something something is going on but boy i don't have the ability or the time to be able to fix it or, or help you with it right now, perhaps we can get you started on some kind of a medication or another, but then have you follow up in the outpatient side, plugging you in with the behavioralist, plugging you in with the psychiatrist just to get that comprehensive mental health uh, that they deserve. So that's kind of what I see for mm -hmm. the most part in the inpatient side. Um, when you talk about challenges, so it's really a question of you know, supply and demand. Um, when you talk about the need for mental health and then what, what supply we have as far as the, the physicians and, and the workforce that we have. So I looked at a couple of um, resources. The World Health Organization put out this report in 2014 saying that we have 12.4 psychiatrists and 4.25 psychiatric nurses per 100,000 patients. Let's compare that to uh, what the primary care field offers. And by the way, primary care as defined by AAMC is family medicine, pediatrics, geriatrics, and internal medicine. 2014 report said we had 91.9 .9 PCPs or primary care physicians per 100,000 patients in the same year, 2014. That's so. So we have 90, 91 docs, uh, primary care physicians per 100,000 people, but we only have 12.5 psychi psych psychiatrists. Now, yeah. you, if you take that number and you look at other countries, um, Norway, for example, has 29.69 psychiatrists and 123 psychiatric nurses per 100,000 people. So that's a robust um, supply of mental health for the demand that, that exists in that country. UK, we compare ourselves to UK all the time. They have 14.63 psychiatrists and 67 nurses. Um, so when you talk about what kind of issues that we have in the inpatient setting, one is awareness, two is, is, is getting a psychiatrist out there sometimes can be challenging to, to help to assess the patient and get them on the right medicine. So a lot of times that just gets shifted on the outpatient side. And right. unfortunately, we miss a lot of that. People you see at the hospital, that, that might be the only chance that they get mental health service. Right. So a lot of times, um, for whatever reason, um, they're not accessing primary uh, mental health from mm -hmm. their primary care physician or other, or, or other services because they haven't been picked up or identified. And, and what we lose out on a lot is this integration, kind of what happens on the inpatient side. And then when you ship or what, when, when the patient's done with that acute episode and go into the out, outpatient side, um, that piece is never connected. So they never are able to see, get that help. Mm -hmm. What are some possible solutions to this then? So, one, you know, it's having better communications throughout the systems. I think one of the things that we are struggling with um, as a country, as a nation, as health systems is our uh, broken communication piece. Uh, what happens in one setting doesn't always get communicated to the other settings. 
And uh, even if it sometimes gets communicated, um, we aren't paying attention or, or we, we miss, miss some of those things. And so um, one is being able to communicate with all the healthcare providers that's taking care of this person in a more integrated, more um, open and a, a better way um, right. to, to let know. So if I diagnose somebody with depression in the inpatient side, I need to be able to communicate that and that needs to be acted upon. In right. the outpatient side, and you just like brought on this piece uh, about electronic healthcare records, right? It's still very separate. You know, behavioral health has their own. You know, it's private. It's considered as confidential. Uh, not mm-hmm. all primary care or any extensiveness can can access that. Yeah, because and that's that's the one of the. That's one of the shocking things is that, you know, if if we're talking about integration, you know, as, as, uh, of mental health and, and primary care, uh, we have we look at the structural barriers to it. Um, mental health doesn't get paid the same way uh, primary care does. Um, their records are kept separate um, and and are not shared openly. The, the behavioral health the psych- psychologist records are not op- shared openly due to privacy concerns and things like that with the primary care physician. So I think if, um, and, and of course, there's also the question of lack of training because this, this exists in our country today because of how things have been happening for, for, for generations as far as the stigma and everything else that's yeah. concerned with this. So, so we're not communicating with each other well enough to really truly understand the patient and what's happening. Right, and it's not just um, doctor, nurses, you know, people who are like in... Um, as paramedic, I would. I just came across a YouTube video. This young lady called Melina, and I'll link mm-hmm. the, the video down below. And I, she openly talks about her panic attack episode and and her experience, how she was poorly treated, and the paramedic when they arrived to help her, uh, was yelling at her and uh, asking her to stop this panic attack and kind of implying the concept that it's it's her fault to like bring mm-hmm. this condition up and not really having any any knowledge about it um so as a result she did not get any treatment until it, it, it got very delayed to to four to four to five hours later she um was recognized and uh, she was uh, given medication to treat that um you know this really highlights the discrimination stigma and uh, disparity in this population so I think pushing this integrated um, care model, uh, hopefully more people will get trained and have a better understanding in uh, mental health illness and how to better handle it, how to care uh, this person. You know, somehow right now still, we see the mind and the body as two separate things. Yeah. Um, first, I'm so sorry that uh, Melinda was her name. Is that right? Melinda. I think her name is Melinda. I'm so sorry that you experienced this. Um, you know, I I, um, I I wish there was a simple answer or a simple fix to this kind of uh, an instance or an episode, but but this is going to take a lot of people. I think what you're doing, Samantha, here is is exactly the kinds of things opening up co- uh, conversations to, to to talk about mental health is going to be helping our country move towards a higher awareness. So uh, I think one of the things that you brought up, uh, Samantha, uh, was talking about the how, how we view the mind separate from the body. One of the things that was uh, imparted heavily on me in my training at Loma Linda was that we're a part of mind, body. Uh, we're part of this uh, system called, uh, and the way that we learned about it was a biopsychosocial spiritual system. Hmm. That not only are you a part of your mind and body that are interrelated, but you're also a spiritual being as being a human being. And, and, and these different aspects of you have to be in balance and have to be looked upon, looked at and, and working together to, to create uh, a sense of optimal health. So oftentimes we look at them separately. Oftentimes um, here's the mind and you have X, Y, Z disease with the mind and here's your body and this is what it is. And, the things of the body sometimes are easier to look at, to study, to throw a pill at, or, or some kind of a therapy and see how that does. Diseases of the mind are far more complex. They behave in ways that we don't fully understand. 
And I think that's why there's some of that stigma exists. It also has to do with the provider's comfort level as well, because um, when someone is crying and having a panic attack, it can be very uh, frightening as well. But if you have proper training, um, mm -hmm. you, you look at that differently. Uh, you're spot on. I think a lot of us don't have that or, or, or feel comfortable being in those moments where somebody is crying down because of emotional pain. Right. And you can't just give them a narcotic or some kind of other pain medication for it to go away. Right. If you're looking at the clock, you know, I've got yeah. patients lining up and it's a time. Yeah. And so, um, and time and training, and we don't have that comfort level that um, to be able to, to to take somebody through that uh, difficult situation right. that they may be in. Yeah. So you and I talked uh, a few months back, and you mentioned about something called Love Round. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, this is, I think, probably very unique uh, to Loma Linda. Um, so when we talk about rounding and, and the the traditional sense of rounding is, you know, when the physician or the team goes around and, and mm -hmm. rounds on all the patients um, on the inpatient side. Um, you have surgeons who do surgery rounds. Sometimes they do twice a day rounds. And so basically the, the concept of rounding is kind of make, going through and talking about each patient and making sure that we have a plan for each patient and that they need what they, they're, uh, they're getting what they, what they need and kind of helping figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, at Loma Linda, as, as I shared with you a couple moments ago, we have this concept of uh, biopsychosocial spiritual. So this is uh, the work of my mentor um, who recently passed, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Will Alexander, who, uh, who had come up over the years trying to integrate the spiritual aspect into the, the healthcare delivery. So love rounds, um, the best way I could describe it is, 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 a, is a time where we as clinicians and physicians and everybody else go to learn about a patient and their story. Um, there's a lot of power um, in, 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 in stories. And so um, I will describe to you what, what a love round and what that was. <laughs> so once a week, um, our team would get together and we would have however many patients on our service. And we would kind of sit and say, you know, which patient needs a little extra TLC? You know, who needs to uh, a little bit extra help to get through this difficult time? Because, you know, people don't go to the hospital for vacation. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're... time. Very vulnerable. <laughs> exactly. Your control, your body is, you know, being taken over, basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, and and so we would identify at least one one patient or one person who is in this time of illness, acute illness, who is in the hospital to go and learn their story. So Dr. Alexander would come typically, and mind you, he's he was in his nineties when I met him, or, or late eighties and nineties. So he would come every, you know every Thursday um, to our bedside. Um, he would typically have either a clinical psychologist sometimes or somebody else from the Spiritual Institute with him, uh, typically a few medical students, um, all of the residents and oftentimes our attending who was on service that week. We would all gather together um, in, in the hallway in the hospital and one of the interns would share the story of this acute setting. So, you know, they would typically be like, hey, Mr. Joe is here. Um, he has a history of CHF. You know, last week he got a pneumonia and now he is also in a CHF exacerbation. So he's here and maybe talk a little bit about his spiritual side and his psychosocial aspects. And then we would go into the room. And so you have to imagine we have like 10 people <laughs> or more typically <laughs> in these love rounds uh, going into this room. Uh, and we had forewarned the patient. We'd ask for permission to make sure that, you know, we, we could talk with them. And Dr. Alexander would lead and teach us through example on how to connect with people, how to tell a story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what we would do in this love rounds was really to learn about the patient. He, you know, we talk a lot about spirituality and it wasn't about imposing my spirituality on somebody else. It's learning about the person who is in that bed, who's in that time of illness. What is their spirituality? What is their connection to a higher power? Do they have one? And how can we, um, as an entire team, 
be there to help them connect with that higher power. Um, and we would learn things about our patients um, that we never knew. So we were, we would, um, so these, and after we had about a 15 minute conversation, really just a honest to goodness conversation about health, about life, about what they enjoy, you know, what they're looking forward to just to, to again, connect them to their spirituality. Mm-hmm. We would go into the little chapel um, on, on our um, on, on, in the hospital, and we would debrief. And Dr. Alexander would go, "So, Sumed, what did you learn today?" And we would all kind of share our experiences and the, the 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 unique things that we learned from those experiences about our patients that help us treat treat people better, treat the patients better. Now that I have this insight that I would have never had before using that to be more compassionate towards our patients. Um, it was, it was an incredible, incredible time. That's great. And, um, so how do you build that connection though? Like you mentioned about the clear model. Uh Uh-huh. Can you tell us that. Absolutely. So the clear, uh, so, so, you know, as, as Will Alexander was doing this and he's been doing this for many, many years, he wrote this wonderful book called Interweave as well. He, he started to, to try, oh, by the way, I have it right here. It's this wonderful book that he gave to all of us as, um, as a gift when we entered Loma Linda. Mm-hmm. But, um, um, you know, so as, as he was doing this for many years, the idea came, how can we, um, um, substantiate this? How can we uh, make this a little bit more tangible? What's happening in that room? You know, what uh, what are we doing in that room as residents, as as fellow people, and connecting with with other people who are who are currently sick? Um, and that's where the the clear model came from, or the whole person care clear model came from. Mm-hmm. Um, and and this is what it stands for. C stands for connect. The first thing you do is connect with a person and do it through questions related to empathy and connecting with somebody. Um, L is for listen. So the, uh, again, you ask questions about listening and and just really just being there and 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 listening. You know, we, we don't listen often enough as as people. We hear things, but yeah. we don't truly listen. Right. So. It was an experience in list, truly listening to the patient. Uh, the E stands for exploring. And this is kind of where um, we had the opportunity to now, we have connected, we have in, in the initial bridges built, we've let the, the, the person sh- start telling their story and you're presently listening to them intently. Then you're starting to explore uh, some of their physical issues uh, or kind of uh, wellness questions, emotional wellness, spiritual wellness, um, relational, you know, how are their relationships with, with each other, with their family members? How are their relationship with the higher power? How, what, what's happening there? You dig and deep- also, mm-hmm. go ahead. You dig deeper. Yeah. You dig deeper and you dig deeper in some of these, these avenues to say, okay, so now that you have the bridge, you have, you've developed that initial relationship. Let's dig a little bit. And then, Hey, I think a was so important. A, a stood for acknowledgement. You know, knowing that, okay, acknowledging them, I think there's so much power in acknowledging somebody's difficulties or somebody's um, situation to give them that, yes, I, I hear what you're saying and, I, could, and I, uh, I, I definitely understand where you're coming from. I think a lot of people struggle just to be understood, you know, so I think to, to acknowledge that, yes, this is definitely a difficult time or whatever it is um, that they're going through. And then R is to respond, um, is to respond adequately by either asking for the questions or, or responding to them with an empathetic way, given what you've just learned. So that was the model that, that um, after a long time of thinking about, hey, what is happening in these, in these love rounds, um, we, th- that they created to then be able to share with the rest of the world, hey, this is kind of how uh, what we're doing here at Loma Linda is working. Right. So that's such a good way to to frame that and provide um, the the hospitalist or whoever's seeing the patient uh, to kind of go down that list because we really have to meet where the person is, connect with mm-hmm. them, really look at the issues and look at the person as a whole. Um, it's so easy 
uh, to just go in there and okay let's look at your vital signs and uh, mm -hmm. your your lab level is this and how do you feel and completely ignore the part of the humanity yeah right no I, it goes back it goes back to what you said earlier samantha it goes back to saying that we as human beings are so much more comfortable dealing with numbers that are objective that mm -hmm. are right there hey you have a white count of this or you have a potassium of this let me treat it with this you know it's so much easier to do that than to be able to be able to go into that space of vulnerability with the patient Mm -hmm. You know, being able to open yourself up um, to the patient to really connect and listen and, and hear where they are. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. But do you do that when you're around right now? Um, I do. Not always. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but I definitely uh, take time to, to try to apply some of these things that I've learned through my training with the patients. One of my favorite questions that I, I remember Dr. Will, Will Alexander always asking is, hey, what are you famous for? You know, when you go to a patient and at the bedside, you just ask them, what are you famous for? Or do you make the, the best, you know, chicken pot pie that anybody ever knows of? Are you, you know, like, or, and, and, and it's just really interesting to hear people and what they, what they have to say. Or sometimes I ask them, you know, kind of um, what, what are you hopeful for? What are you looking forward to in the next year? So kind of get them thinking a little bit outside of this acute um, and this disease state. So I definitely do apply what I've learned um, in and with my patients even today. And I think by doing that, you're also letting the person know that, hey, I see you. I see you as a person here. Yeah, I see you. I hear you. You're not just another patient that I have to cross off my list to move yeah. on. You know, I, I, I care for you truly as a human being. And I think that's what's that's a part of what's missing in our healthcare system. It's that bringing bringing that humanity back to healthcare, bringing that um, that that human relation mm -hmm. back back to what we do in healthcare. Correct. Yeah. Any thoughts? Any other thoughts to add here? No, I, th uh, I, I thank you for inviting me. I think this is a great way to start some of these conversations um, in and around our country in, in really trying to, what I think is really important to connect uh, the, the two, two uh, un unfortunately divided fields of mental health and, and primary care uh, or, or, or health care together. I think um, it's unfortunate that that's where we are, but I think the work that you're doing is very important and I, and I really appreciate being being here with you today thank you i really appreciate your time as well um, on a sunday doing this interview with me <laughs> so yeah of course. with me and to all our viewers um, thank you for joining us so let's connect again on our next episode to explore what it means to world-class mental health care so see you next time take care bye